trial you might find yourself in, God is the one who wants to solve it. Amen. So, um, um, <clears throat> the Lord has spoke to me, um, I think it was a year and a half ago, and he said, this family, he showed me their faces, he said, said something about them, and I was like, oh, so I said it to Marge, and she was like, okay, I said, I'm going to watch for that, because the Lord showed it to me, and then, boom, that Sunday, there they were, and there it was, and the thing happened, and I was like, wow, it's like you showed it to me before it happened, and it happened, and then it stopped happening, and then months went by, and the Lord spoke to me again and said, it's going to happen again. And I was like, aren't it's going to happen again. And then months went by and it didn't happen. And I said, well, he said it was going to happen. And then boom, it happened again. And then it became the situation. I don't want to tell you the situation, but the situation changed and it became solid as a foundation. What I saw way back a year and a half ago. And I was working on my garden yesterday. It's important to work on your garden. Because that's where God will speak to you. Wow. And he clearly, that whole scene went in front of my face while I was working. And he said to me, when I show you something, I want you to not just agree with me and not just believe it, but I want you to aggressively come into union with it. And I was like, yes, sir. And, and so I have this thing in my heart right now where whatever you're facing, look, if, if your faith only works when you're in the victory, if your faith only works when everything's working out, that isn't faith. Faith believes when it doesn't see because it's promised by God. And God wants your praise, your honor, and your voice, and your commitment to him, especially when things go off. Especially then. That is when, especially when, he wants us to come into agreement with him. So I made a commitment to the Lord out there in the garden. And I said, okay, I'm up in my game. From now on, when you say something to me, it doesn't matter to me if the whole world doesn't believe it. I'm going to start confessing it, speaking it, and declaring it because I want to be a kind of person who leads and doesn't foul the crowd into the ditch. You know, this world needs leaders right now, people. We need leaders right now in this world, big time. And so uh, today, the message is called Your Jewish Heart. <laughs> Do I got you baited? <laughs> Your Jewish Heart. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 2. So I invite you to go there. So today, for whatever reason, which doesn't really matter, it's quiet in here. Have you noticed how quiet it is here today? I noticed the worship team cut it really short today. I noticed the last song we did, Paul was doing his lullaby song <laughs> cradling us and just rocking us there and it was almost like you had been out of order to be loud at that moment it's like there's a peace there's a silence and that's good it's important to know how to be quiet as well as how to be loud in the Lord both are appropriate so this is your Jewish heart this is Romans chapter 2 verse 17 and if I talk really slow and really methodical it's because that music is going to pull me in <laughs> so, so you better jazz it up son. <laughs> so it says indeed you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, 
having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. As it is written, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one hourly, nor is the circumc circumcision which is outward of the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not from men but from God. Jewishness is a condition of the believer, not a race of natural people. Many people were born to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And many of them were never children of promise. Many people have become Christians and become a true Jew, including Jews. Paul, Peter, James, all those Jews became Christians and became true Jews because their circumcision was now of the heart and not of the flesh. And their heart, so when you think about circumcision, I want to just talk about that for a second so we don't miss this. Why did God say circumcision? Because it's the cutting away of the filth of the flesh. So that's what the symbol means to make more clean. Okay, so it removes something that could be unclean. And so when he transfers from your maleness to your heart, he's given you this metaphor, this example that he's cleansing, cutting the filth of the flesh away from your heart so that you'd be freed, so that you would no longer walk in the flesh, but that you would walk in the spirit which has now come to abide with you. So the person whose heart is circumcised is the true Jew. Anybody? Anybody with me? Okay. So, we are not anti-Semite. We are Semite. We are Jewish. We are spiritually the true Israel of God. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue. I want you to consider this fact. That the first man and the first woman, woman was Gentiles. Come on. So, Jews came from Gentiles. Right? Abraham's father and mother was an Amorite and a Hittite. So I want you to know, the fact is when they became Jewish is when their, their hearts became en engrafted to God. When they started to obey God. When they started to follow God. And I could read, I'm not going to take time on it right now, but I could read to you about Abraham, how it talks about in Romans chapter 3, how Abraham, was he made righteous through circumcision or did he, was he circumcised because he was righteous? But righteousness was imputed to Abraham before his circumcision. Therefore, God had him circumcised as a sign that he was righteous. 
So outward circumcision doesn't make you righteous. Righteousness causes circumcision to come to you. So Jesus Christ died to take away your sins on the cross so that you could be circumcised in your heart as a sign that you have become one of God's children. It's interesting that God's interested in your heart. Now, Mark didn't have a clue what I was preaching today, but amazingly, he stood up here and started preaching about the heart. That your whole heart, he's up here, your whole heart, you're going to serve God. I'm saying, Mark, that's the message today. God's after your heart. You know, you can be as ceremonial as you want to be. God is not interested in your two hours on Sunday. He's interested in your whole entire life. If he doesn't have your heart, he, does, he knows he doesn't have you. So I've got a litany of scriptures I'd like to quickly show you. Um, I don't know who's on the projector, but if you want to project out some scriptures for me, you could. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5 first, then 6, then 12, then 13, then 15, then 22. Did you get that? <laughs> So this is uh, Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So let me give you another one. Those who are not pure in heart will not see God. <laughs> okay, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know where your heart is by what you treasure. Um, can I just have a moment here and just say to you, my job as a minister is to bring you face to face with the reality of where you are so that you either can be confirmed or you can bail on that wicked position and give your whole heart to God. So this is where we're going. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's what God gave me this morning. That's what he told me. He says, I want my people's heart involved. I want them to have a treasure in me. I want them to give me their whole life. So I made a statement the other day, and Jill so graciously responded to that. I don't know if she's here. Oh, there, there you are. Okay. I love how you responded to that. It made it so much more important. <laughs> it's like I said it. Come right out of my heart. And then you went, huh, that's amazing. You know? And I thought, wow, that's really important. <laughs> you know, when you live close to God and you live in the Word and you're always in the Scriptures and you're always in prayer and you always have a lifestyle like this, you're going to have treasures pop out of you all the time. And sometimes it's someone else's appreciation that makes you realize how strong that is. Uh, some people accuse me of being strong. And I don't feel like I'm being strong. I just feel like I'm represent, uh, representing a strong God. Okay, God, yeah, thank you, yeah. God wants your whole heart. He doesn't want part of it. He wants your whole heart. Okay, so look, I just want you to know, if you want a relationship with Father God through Jesus Christ, then Father God wants your whole heart. He doesn't want part of it. So this is the statement, okay? So the statement that I told Jill, or I was speaking there and she was standing there, uh, was anybody who has received Christ into the heart basically can go and live their own will. You know, you, you rec I received Christ. You say, well, did you get, people say, "Jesus saved." Yeah, yeah, I received Christ when I was when I was eight years old. You know, people have all kinds of responses. Yeah, I received Christ, and people stop right there. So, so the question for you today is not, "Did you receive Christ?" The question today is, "Did Christ receive you?" So when I received Christ. I took him into my world, and I lived my world with him, and I felt convictions and certain things. But as I matured and grew in the Lord, I put my life into him. And I stopped saying I'm going to do this and that or the other thing, except 
his will be done. So if his will trumps any will I have, his will comes first and everything else comes second. If he tells me to be quiet, then I'm quiet. If he tells me to speak, I'm going to speak. If he tells me to confront something, I confront it. If he tells me to back off, I back off. Whatever his will is. And so as I read the scriptures, I'm not reading a religious manual about my ceremonial approach to being a Christian. I'm reading Emmanuel, which is God with me and me with God living life together. Right, so God wants to be your Emmanuel. He wants to be the living God having life and doing life with you. He doesn't want to be your second thought, your third thought, or some thought, or a trial has to hit you for you to wake up and realize, oh, God. So you think, well, gee, he's awful selfish. He wants all my time. No, he loves you, and he wants to be a part of you. It's not about ego or self-centeredness. It's about one who loves you and wants you. He wants to, he wants to do life with us. Look, you are here because of him. So recently I was talking to someone at night, and they're not in the Lord. And and the guy's wife says, well, he's not religious. And I was like, you know, I've come to the point where I realize that's a cap out. There's no such thing as somebody who's not religious. So I said to him, were you created by God? Yeah. I said, well, then you're, you're religious. You know what I mean? In, in the sense, the better sense of the word religion. So I just want you to know, there's no such thing as someone who's not spiritual. Come on, help me out here. There's no one who's not spiritual. And everybody was born from the spirit realm by God. God brought you from he knew you before you were in your mother's womb, and he brought you into this world and placed you into family, because the Bible says he places the solitary into families. And he put you there. And mom and dad might think that they, you're their idea, but I'm here to tell you, way before them was God who chose to put you here. And you might say, well, I had a crappy mom and a crappy dad, and it was terrible. It doesn't matter. God knew you before you were in mom and dad's family. And God is the father, like Mark said, that I always needed. God is the father that I always needed. And so the sooner you start to realize you are in this world, not to be a contractor, not to be a, a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer or anything else. You are here to become a son of the Most High God and to manifest His will in the earth through contracting, through lawyers, through doctors, through nursing, through, through parenting and through every other thing. But I am not any of those things. I am what He sent me here to be. So when I take my will out of the picture and I put myself into his will, I then start looking to him for his guidance and his direction about where I'm going. Amen. Right. So I, I really appreciate people who surrender to God. And um, this past weekend, of course, the teen girls had a special outing at, at Nicolette's house. And, and I know Zoe and Ava went over there with all their friends and we had a whole house full of girls because of Zoe's birthday overnight and uh, Zoe's 14, wow it's good, nice to see you singing and the worship team as well and uh, so they went over to Nicolette's house well Nicolette gives herself to God she's available did you hear Paul, can you not feel I leaned right over as soon as he started he says, what is that and she goes What'd you say? No guile. Paul, no guile. That's what, it's just penetrating, like through the silence almost. It's like, but Paul and Nicolette, you know, your household, your lives, you, they place themselves in God's hands. They've begun to yield to him on a level where the Holy Ghost is manifesting out of them. Well, naturally, then there was a, there were some girls there which were Baptists. There were some girls there which are uh, not in the Lord. And there are some girls there which are old friends. And the spirits are manifesting. They prophesied over all the girls. And girls were weeping. 
and they're like, what is this? You know, and it's like people, it doesn't matter. You know, and can I just say something about labels as well? People say, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist, I'm this and that. You're not. You're not. You're not. There's no tag on you. I remember my dad used to say to me, you're a Catholic. I said, show me the tag. <laughs> show me the tag. I said, there's no label on this. I come from God. I'm not a label of man. I'm an assignment of God. Can you say, I'm an assignment of God? So the sooner you recognize the only main reason you're in this world, the only main reason is God. It's not marriage. It's not children. It's not work. It's not a career. It's not a 401k. It is not to do some great spectacular thing in the earth. The main reason you're here on this planet is to discover by faith the life of God in you. And then allow that to lead you into every great exploit according to his will and not according to your predetermined plan or your culture or whatever else. That's why the Bible says that we are saved from this present evil generation. Why is it this present evil generation? Well, because they don't live according to God's will. They live according to their own will. So maybe... We need to be saved from the church who operates in their own will with Christ in them and not according to his will. Maybe if you think about this. Look, uh, you got time. You got time. You got at least another couple minutes. You aren't dead yet. You're still here. You're, you're, you're still alive. You're still breathing, right? Okay, so you have an opportunity right now to turn to make a move, to come into, to surrender. Can you say surrender? See, some of you won't even say surrender because you're, you're not surrendered. You won't surrender. You say, well, I don't have to obey you. You're not charging me. I know that's the problem because God sent ministers into this world to steer his people into life. And when you resist ministers, you resist God. It's true. I'm telling you, it's true. And uh, so what happens is, when Israel got together and there was a big shout in the house, they shouted, let there be a shout in the house of God, loud cymbals and, and stringed instruments and, and vocal, and it says, and dancing. And people say, I don't dance. Well, that proves it's your will and not his. They say, why well, don't worship? Well, that proves it's your will and not his. Because you should never tell God what you are because he's the one who authored you and he's the one who inscribes his law upon your heart and he's the one who makes you successful. He's the one who causes you to prosper in the way. If you don't yield to him, you won't prosper in the way. I know you're thinking of money. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about peace in your family and peace in your children and peace in your world. And I'm talking about having the influence and not having to think about what you're going to say when someone says some crazy thing in society, but an answer from God comes and arises out of you and speaks. So have you taken Christ into your heart? Y'all yeah, want to ask you, are you going to put you into Christ? That's the question today. So it says in uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Um, I want to read this one, Matthew chapter 12. I'm fighting for you. Stop resisting, please. Stop resisting. You say, I'm not resisting. I'm not talking to you. And if Katrina was here, she would think I was talking to her because she's got such a delicate heart. She takes everything to her. <laughs> I, I just realized some people are so open to God. They, any correction, anything that comes, they're like, <laughs> you know. And, and that's because they're so yielded to God. I, every time someone's preaching, I'm sitting there going, is he talking to me? You're probably thinking I'm not thinking that. Maybe you're thinking I'm like, well, he, he, I wonder if he really agrees with what they're saying. I'm sitting there going, oh, Lord, is that me? Stay soft. Stay supple. If you can't be reached, then I got some intelligent news for you. You can't be reached. <laughs> 
Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. It says, uh, blood of vipers, how can you be an evil? Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasures, brings forth evil things. Yikes. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in, <laughs> in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I don't like that. Now I have to tell you, I have to I have to tell you, I gotta be honest, I'm an honest preacher. This was written to men under the law. At that time, they were going to be judged according to the law. Okay, so I want you to know that. This isn't a New Testament thought. This is a, a transitionary period. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nobody was born again. The disciples were not born again. The blood of Jesus had not yet been spilled. He did not take it into heaven. He did not redeem mankind. He did not release the Holy Spirit so salvation could happen. None of that happened yet. So he's speaking here to men under the law. But I, but I want you to know, this law came from God. So there's elements of it, even though we're not justified uh, under law by what we do and do not do anymore, there's still the issue of it came out of God, that God cares about what you say and what you do. And that's why he says, I want your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole mind. So make sure that you hang on to the fact that there's a good treasure needs to come out of you. So this is uh, Matthew 13, 19. So this is just Matthew prophesying to us about how God um, spoke through Jesus Christ. It says, He who hears the word of the kingdom, oh yeah, 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 that's a big scripture. This is all about the parable of the sower. So it says that a man, the kingdom of God is like a man who went out to sow seeds, and he was throwing seeds. He said some of the seeds fell on the wayside, the pathway. Some of the seeds fell on the stony ground, some of the seeds fell on the thorns, and some in the good soil, the good ground. He says, the seed is the word of God, okay? So the seed is the word of God. So I'm giving you the backdrop of this scripture. The seed is the word of God. And so this scripture, wow, is talking about that when the seed is sown into the heart and they don't understand it, the enemy comes and immediately steals it out of their heart. He takes it away from them. Okay, so, wow. Okay, so if you attend church, if you watch sermons online, if you read Christian literature, and you don't come to understanding, I can tell you something right now. Satan will steal that word out of your heart. Okay, so God wants to affect our heart. This is what it's about. You know, look, we've come into a Jewish heart. Why? Because we've surrendered our lives to God, and he gave us a Jewish heart. He gave us a relationship. Our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind has been surrendered to God. And so if your heart, if you're, you're compartmentalizing and keeping certain factors away from God, then what happens is, that is the area where you're going to get tangled up. That's the area where Satan's going to get you. I remember years ago, I, I preached it to you because it happened to me where my mind one day, God showed my, my mind like a corridor. It was like this corridor, and I saw doors on either side. And so there were doors on the left, and there was doors on the right. And I was looking down the hallway, and I, and I realized I was in my mind. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. So I opened the first door, and it was Marge and the kids and everybody I love. I opened the door on the left and it was, you know, it was all the things I enjoy, hunting and fishing and having a good time and all these wonderful things. I opened the other door and it was just every kind of compartment, but I was getting closer to the back left door. <laughs> I started getting nervous. I thought, oh boy. Because in my mind, I still had a couple of areas of strongholds, things that were trying to, Satan had 
an area of seed in me. He had seed in me. He had got something into me. He took the word out of that area, that compartment, and he put some seeds in my head. And in that area, I was, I was spinning my wheels. And I was like, oh, boy. And, and so the problem was I was afraid of that door. So when I opened it, it wasn't pretty. So then one day I was going and praying. I said, God, what do I do with this? This is like crazy. You know, the, the last place they want you to be is in the last door on the left. So I said, well, let's do it. So I said, come on, Lord. So I invited Jesus to come on a walk with me down the corridor of my mind. They opened the door, and there's Margie, the girls, their husbands, their grandkids. I was like, this is good. This is really good. And his light shined right in there. I was like, oh, that's a generational blessing right there. And the blessing of the Lord was penetrating into my son-in-laws, into my daughters, into my grandchildren. When I saw the blessing of God, it's going to carry on there because I had exposed that to him. Come on, expose your family to God. Stop defending them. Stop trying to physically, naturally be the blockade against people's opinions or anything. To let them have their opinion. Expose your family to God. And I, after that period of time, I started witnessing in a stronger way to all my family members. It's like something opened in me because of the exposure of God. So then I, I went to the next door and I said, all right, use this hunting, use this fishing, use these desires, these things I love to do, gardens and planting things and trees and fruit trees and all this stuff. And, and the light of God was shining in there. And I just went down, boom, boom, boom. And I thought, here comes Jesus. And I, in my mind, I was seeing Jesus standing right next to me. And I was looking up to him. You know, he's tall. <laughs> and I was like, you ready for this? <laughs> I've never let you in here before. But it's over today. I got really scared. I felt my lip quivering. Where's Larry? Larry, I did the Larry lip quiver. <laughs> uh, I says, well, here goes, Lord. I said, I'm not holding back, and I'm not hiding anything, and I want you to see everything as I see it. There it is. And I was like, and the light of Jesus went into that room. And all of a sudden, images changed from corruption and horror into brokenness and damage that needs salvation. And I stood there amazed at how the imagery changed. The imagery all changed. And Christ's light shined into that compartment of my life. And it strapped the devil of having seed in my life to do anything in that realm. And I just wonder how exposed are you? How much vulnerability is in you? How much ground are you sowing to the devil so that he can abuse you? God wants your heart, and God wants your Jewish heart. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to thank God. So, praise God, I became a better husband, a better father, a better minister, a better everything uh, on that day because Jesus didn't have a compartment that was no longer available to him. It's a little scary, eh? scary. Do you know something? Andre said something when he was here in 2014. First time he ever came. This is what he said. He said, Jesus, uh, you know, Lord said, I want to go with you to the movies. Because Andre liked going to the movies. He was like, oh, okay. So he, you know, he had afternoons free, so he'd go watch movies. And he went to the movie, and he was looking at the movie board. He goes, well, I better not choose that one. That wouldn't be appropriate for God. And he said, the Lord said to me, no, I want to go see what you see. He was like, oh, okay. So is he, and, and that rung a bell with me. Because I went through that whole thing years earlier of how God, I allowed him to expose his light into that, that compartment. And, you know, when you take the Lord in a conscious way into your life, there's a whole lot of things you won't do anymore. 
there's a whole lot of things you won't do. There's a whole lot of things you won't be comfortable with. And there's a whole lot of strength that he gives you to recognize the true spiritual nature of what you're a part of. I love that. Take Jesus to the movies with you. Don't leave him outside. Because if he's outside, then Satan's on the inside. Wherever the Lord's not, the enemy has sway. So don't have a compartment for the enemy. So um, <clears throat> this is Matthew 15, 8. This people draws near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. Yahoo! Ah. Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart. Can you say all my heart? You see, God wants all of your heart. He will bless your crops. He'll bless your business. He'll bless your family. He'll bless your thoughts. He'll bless your life. But he wants all of your heart. He doesn't want your business owning your heart. He doesn't want your, your, your fun games and things you like to do owning your heart. He wants your heart, your treasure to be in the Lord. Amen. Leon, we know you agree with this. If one thing we know about you is your whole heart wants God. You really want God. You know, uh, we were at a funeral recently, and there was a group of us there. Someone else was doing the funeral, and this preacher got up. Leon was there and a bunch of us. And the guy said some good stuff. And Leon's going, hey, man, that's right. Yes. And these people weren't used to it. So you, could, you could feel it. And the guy was, he was hitting home runs. Boom, boom. And Leon, yeah, man, yes. And then the guy went off course, and Leon went silent. It was so obvious where his doctrines were off. <laughs> because he was preaching doctrines of men. And then Leon's voice went silent. The reason Leon was silent is because he honors God with his whole heart, and he isn't going to amen a lie. But when he hears the truth, he likes to amen. Amen, amen. Now he's silent. Okay. <laughs> so um, in Matthew 13, I read to you, he who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and takes it away, that which was sown in his heart, right? So I want you to think about this, how it affects your whole heart or your whole life. So when he says, your heart, the, the word of God is sown and it's supposed to go into your heart. It doesn't even talk about your mind. Your mind is under your control. But your heart, God sows his word into your heart. So a lot of people, um, they judge with their mind. So they'll sit there like this. Oh, I don't know if I agree with that. Oh, yeah. Well, that, yep, yeah, I agree with that. No. Oh. No, that's all mental stuff. God isn't even there. It's heart. When the word of God's going out, it's supposed to seed your heart because the issues of life come from the heart. So when the word of God goes into your heart, what's that talking about? Well, in the Greek, it's cardia. In, in the Hebrew, it's a different word, but they both mean the central core of your heart mind, will, and emotions, or your intellect, your feelings, your will. So it's kind of like there's a whole bunch of words to define that, describe that in the Greek and the Hebrew, but both the Hebrew and the Greek, they're very similar. It has to do with the center of what you are. That's why it's called the heart, the core. The, the, in Latin literature, the word in the Greek is actually core, and they translated it heart because it sounded more amicable to what we think but it's the core it's the the central thing that produces life to the rest of the whole body right so what is your heart your heart is the core of your 
thoughts, the core of your love, your passion, your, not just your thoughts, but your actions. So what I am at the core is going to manifest out of my mind and out of my life in terms of action, right? Yes? Okay, so, like, for example, like, some people, they can't tithe. They can't do it. I'm not saying they won't. I'm saying they can It's not that they won't. They can because in their core, they're in prison. They got, a, they got a compartment there. It's in bondage, and it does not yet yield to God. It does not yet honor Him. Some people have it in worship. They won't worship. They weren't taught that way. They have learned that way. They won't be exuberant. They won't shout. They won't sing. They won't participate. They won't dance because that part of their heart is locked off from God. What was that scripture you read us earlier? You, you said that scripture was all your heart, and then there were the principles that followed. Yeah. So, yeah, so how, how does that, maybe you can give me back some of that. I thought, well, he's preaching the word. You're preaching the exact same message I'm preaching. Yeah, so my heart is set on your precepts. You see, when the Word of God comes, it's supposed to affect your thoughts, because of your heart, to affect your thoughts and your actions. Church isn't a place you come to fulfill your obligation, because you have none. It's a free gift. Church is a place you gather with the people of God to have the Word of God sown into your heart so that it'll change the way you think and act because it's the core of what I am, not just the information that's going into my mind. If it doesn't reach your heart, it's just religious jargon, ceremonial exercises of your brain, and it does not please God. It does not please God. You better do something with that music. Just a little bit more energy, something. I, I am, I'm gonna lull these guys right off here. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna sing a song in a minute. But I'm not done, so don't expect me to be done. When they walk out, that doesn't mean I'm done. That just means they're ready. So don't be confused about what's happening right now. Yeah, that's good, that's good. You know, one thing I know, I know what authority is, and I know where I have it, and I know where I don't. If you ever mess with my family, you will discover the great authority of Chris Forensic. If you ever mess with my church, you will also understand the great authority of Chris Forensic. But if you mess with me, I'll probably just laugh. We are defenders of that which is valuable. The treasure of my heart is the church. You understand the treasure. So you're going to get this because God is trying to rescue some people right now from that which binds. It says in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you so you can walk in my ways. So that you can walk in my ways. If it doesn't lead to walking in his ways, you've just got a religious ascent in your mind of a new heart and a new spirit. It's just here. It's all in here. This doesn't save anybody. It's when it comes into your heart that changes your mind. It changes your actions. It changes your way. So he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you so that you can walk in my ways. He's not interested in just your religious obligations. He's interested in all your obligations. He wants to be involved in your life. God is interested in your entire life. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means with all your life, your ways, your heart, which leads to your ways. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Keep. Keep is a word, it's a military term. A keep is someone who's guarding and watching for the enemy. He's not letting anybody through this doorway or this gate. 
It says, keep, militarily, guard your heart. For out of it, well, it says, keep it with all diligence. For out of it flow the issues of life. The word issues is boundaries and borders of life. The boundaries and the borders of life. So God's saying, I knew you before you in your mother's womb, and I know what the boundaries and borders are for your life that I created you for. You don't know it. So I'm going to reveal it to you. I'm going to sow my word into your heart so that you can be converted from the ways of this world to the boundaries and borders which I have prescribed for you. And if you'll stay in the boundaries which I have prescribed for you, then the blessings that I have prepared for you will come upon you, upon your children, upon the generations which follow you. Can someone say amen? Praise the Lord. Can you stand, please? So, um, I will never be a partial preacher. Never will I be somebody who is trying to build a church by consensus or by lowering the bar so more people can get in. We are preaching the message of God. It's the message of Jesus Christ. It's the message of the apostles. We are not preaching our own message. Today, Matthew, the apostle of God, is encouraging you to give your whole heart to God. To surrender your whole life. Instead of receiving Jesus into your life only, Jesus wants to receive your life into Him. So that wherever you go and whatever you do will be according to His will and according to His ways. I think people in the past said it this way. They said, Jesus is your Savior, but is He your Lord? I think that's what they were trying to say. Is He the governor, the ruler, the director of your affairs, not just the Savior of your life? So today I'm offering to you a step up into maturity. Last week, the Lord had given me a word and, and told me, I want you to invite people to join my kingdom. And we had some. We had seven different people raise their hand for that. Two responded by coming forward. But I believe that the seven were brought into the touch of God. And, they're in a, you know, sometimes we focus on the birth of being born again. But sometimes they're in the birth canal. And we're saying, Bush! And we get them a little further. <laughs> a little further. And one day, they're going to crown. And then there's going to be a baby. And I learned all that from my wife. <laughs> and by being there. <laughs> and I'm not going to mention that I passed out. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So today before you is an opportunity. And don't say, well, you know, I, not today, someday. You don't have any say over the matter at all. I'm telling you, what's in God's hands, don't let it be in your hands. See, if you're so cavalier that you're saying, well, someday. That's your will imposing against the will of God, against his word. And that's hardness of heart. And so today, God wants to save you out of hardness of heart. And he wants to invite you to go from just being saved into maturity, which is, I'm going to surrender to my life in Christ. Christ is in me. Now I'm in Christ. And so, look, these things don't happen like all at once. But it all starts with surrender. It all starts with a prayer. It all starts with God. I surrender. I Yes, show me, enlighten me, open my heart, open those doors in the, the corridor of my mind so that I can expose this rotten rubbish to you so that your light can shine into my soul and deliver me from everything that tries to keep me bound. I don't want Satan to have any will in my life. Now, Jesus made, said this, these words, powerful words. Satan has nothing in me. 
What was he talking about? His mind and his will and his actions were for God. Isn't that amazing? He has nothing in me. That's the goal that each one can say, he has nothing in me. Could you please bow your head? And I'm inviting you now. And even if you're at home and online or wherever you are in the office, God is there wherever you are. He's there. And I just ask you to bow your head and just consider with me for a moment. Are you still living an independent life with Christ at the inside? Won't you make the move to surrender in your life yet to the next step of Christian maturity, which is my whole heart belongs to you, Lord, not just part of my heart. I'm not going to segregate my thoughts. I'm not going to close off some compartment from you anymore. And I'm not going to live according to my own will. I want to transition across that line. I want to move into mature Christian living. But today, if that's you, I don't want anybody to see you doing this. I just want you to do it. Just in your heart. Don't even speak out loud. Don't let anybody even hear you. This is an issue of the heart. This is something between you and God. And as long as He hears you, then we've hit the mark on what we're doing here today. So you just pray with me. I'll help you pray. Just, Father, I want to make a move. I want to become a mature believer. I want to move today. I want to move from just having Christ in me to having me in Christ. And so I just make that move today in my heart. I just say, Lord, all my heart belongs to you. I surrender all my heart. That means all my thoughts, all my decisions, all my choices, all my ways, and all my actions from this moment forward. I say, you are the Lord of my life. You're the one who's the governor, the guide, and the director of the affairs of my life. I'm asking you to lead me forward from here and strengthen me so that I might consult you about all my decisions, about my life, about where I'm going, what I'm doing. May I start to say, I'm going to do such and such if it be the, your will. I'm going to start surrendering my plans to your will. I'm going to look to you to see if it's what you chose for me instead of just choosing everything without considering you. So Father, today I surrender to your will and I take a giant step up into the will of God for my destiny. In Jesus' name.